Good evening. Um, my name is Patricia Zhang. I am one of the non-operative spine physicians here within the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Our goal as the non-operative spine service is to really empower our patients to better manage their own back pain in the least invasive way. So we do this by working closely with physical therapists, with orthotists, with the behavior psychologists, and also pain management physicians. And I do believe a key part of what we do is actually patient education. So I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak to you all today. So back pain is extremely common. If you are lucky enough to live long enough, I believe you're gonna probably experience life, uh, back pain at least once in your lifetime. And so there has been some studies which have shown that the lifetime chance of developing back pain for more than three months can be as high as 90%. But contrary to popular belief, you're not destined to have chronic back pain as you age. So there's been a couple of really large observational studies that have been performed. They all show the same trend, which is that sometimes the back pain actually get better once you enter your 60s and 70s. So this is one of the studies that um, showed this trend. So they looked at about 2,377 patients. And on the x-axis, we have different age groups. And on the y-axis, we have the prevalence of chronic back pain. And as you can see, the peak age about which people have back pain is actually between 40s and 60s. And by the time you're in your 70s, you're actually having back pain less often. We don't really know why this is. Um, maybe with wisdom, uh, with the age, you get more wise. And so instead of lifting that 100-pound box, you hire movers instead. But there's likely structural issues as well. So we do know that with time, our ligaments and our discs, they become stiffer. So disc herniation is actually less likely to happen in our 70s. So there's a lot of myths about back pain. And what I want to do today is to dispel some of those misconceptions. I want to talk to you about how we can diagnose the cause of back pain and why the tools we have are actually quite imperfect. I want to focus on what management options you do have access to that's been proven to be helpful and what risk factors you can actually control and pay attention to. So let's get started by busting some myths. Um, you know, I get really worried when patients come to me and they say, geez, I've been, I've been in bed for the last week. One, I get worried because the pain must have been pretty bad for you to have been in bed for the last week. But two, bad rest, bed rest is particularly bad for you. So they've done studies in the intensive care unit where patients are really sick and they're basically in bed all day long. And after seven days of immobilization, these patients have lost 40% of their muscle strength. That's 40% in seven days. So bed rest is really just bad for you. And there's been studies which specifically show that bed rest is bad for back pain. So this was a pretty well-designed study that was published in 1995. They took their patients and assigned them into three different groups. So one group was put on strict bed rest after they've developed back pain. So these patients only have had back pain for one to two days, and they were told that they need to be on strict bed rest for two days. A different uh, group of these patients were told to begin aggressive exercises. So they were sent to the physical therapist. They were like, you need to strengthen right now, even though you've just developed back pain. And the third group, they were like, you do whatever you feel your body tells you to do. So they followed these patients out for 12 weeks, and this is what they found. So there's a bed rest group, there's an exercise group, and then there's the normal care group. And the first thing they looked at is the number of six days that they took in this 12-week period. And they found that compared to the people who are just told to do whatever they, they feel like their body is telling them, the people who are on bed rest actually had more, taken more sick days. And actually, the people who were actually sent to aggressive exercise right at the start, they were actually also um, taking more sick days. When they looked at the intensity of pain, at 12 weeks, they found that the bed rest group did the worst. So these individuals had a significantly increased back pain at 12 weeks as compared to people who were just told that they should just go about their normal activities. Their exercise group actually didn't show a significantly increased back pain. 
So what's the take home from this? So I tell patients that your body knows best. If you're having new back pain and severe, do what you can and rest when you need to. I don't think patients should put themselves on bed rest because they think that would help because bed rest has been shown to not help in low back pain. Another thing I hear commonly is that they've been, patients have been told that disc degeneration is a disease. So what is disc degeneration? So let's just review what is a disc. So in the body, we have the spine. It gives us structural support and it functions also to, to protect our neurological structure. So like the spinal cord and the nerves that are gonna exit at each level and, and go down to our legs. And you can see these structures in an MRI as well. So we have the bones, the vertebrae, as well as the discs, which are like little donut shock absorbers in our back. And with time, we develop disc degeneration. So here we see a very young, healthy disc. It's nice and plump. As time goes on, we lose some of that height. It becomes more dried out, which we call desiccation. So it no longer is white, which means it's filled with fluid, it becomes dark. And as time goes on, it can even become more narrow. Eventually, when the disc degeneration is bad enough, or if there was an acute inflammation, we can actually have some swelling around that disc. But I don't think it's fair to call disc degeneration a disease. After all, getting wrinkles is not getting a disease. And just as we age and we get wrinkles, our discs would also dry out and degenerate. And to show this, um, they did a study um, of about like a little bit more than 300 individuals. So here we have, again, age group on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have percent of individuals with disc degeneration. And take it that all these individuals actually have had no back pain at all. They're asymptomatic. They do not have back pain. And if you look, by the time you're in your 60s and 70s, almost 100% of them, these individuals didn't even have back pain, almost 100% of them have had disc degeneration. So it's almost universal. Another myth I always hear is that people are at the physician office wanting to get a diagnosis. They're very eager and they want to do whatever it takes to figure out what is the cause of the back pain. And I understand that desire. I really want to get to the bottom of things. But to be totally honest, we're not able to find out the cause of your back pain more than a majority of the time. The quoted frequency at which we're able to diagnose the exact cause of back pain is um, you know, in the 30% range. So this is taking patients who presented to the doctor office with back pain. And 70% of the patients were never able to tell them exactly what happened, and their pain is usually already better. The other 30%, sometimes we are able to find things, and we do have some management um, options for those patients. But diagnosis is often difficult. So I wanna spend the next couple of minutes talking about what tools we have to diagnose back pain and why diagnosing the cause of back pain is so difficult. There are definitely barriers to diagnosis. So, you know, one of them is that back pain is multifactorial. There's a lot of structures in the back that can cause pain. And of the diagnostic tools that we do have, none of them is a pain meter They don't really show us exactly where the pain is coming from. And back pain is in general a very difficult condition to study because it is very heterogeneous. So by that, I mean there's a lot of variability in a course. A lot of people get better, a lot of them get worse, there's a lot of different causes. So because it's such a, a varied population, it's hard to study. So let's first just talk about what in the back can cause pain. So I wanna bring you back to this graphic, which I showed before. This is your spine. In the spine, we have bones and we have discs. And if we were to look at these discs from above, so taking the cross-sectional view, you would see that the discs are made of an annulus, so they're kind of fibers that, that hold the disc together, as well as a nucleus, which is, I like to think of them as kind of the jelly that fills the middle of the disc. And this is how it functions as a shock absorber. 
I briefly mentioned before that the purpose of the spine is to protect the neural structure, so the spinal cord, and the nerves that exit at each level. And these nerves in the low back, they, they go on to supply your sensation and your strength to your legs. So one thing that we have heard of that commonly cause back pain would be a disc herniation. So that's when a disc protrudes. So the middle, the nucleus, is no longer contained by the annulus, the fibers around it. The nucleus is bulging out. And this can cause pain in itself, and it can cause what is commonly known as sciatica, when it's pushing on a nerve that's trying to exit, that's going to go down your leg. Disc herniations are not the only things that can cause pain. So we have disc herniation and sometimes the sciatica that happens when the disc is pushing on a nerve. As we age, I showed you before, the discs get narrower. And so because of that, you can develop what is called a thickened, thickened ligament flavin. So just thickened ligaments in the back of the spine. And the reason for this, I don't think thickened ligament flavin is a good um, name for what's happening. But basically, you know, if you were to have a, a string, so a ligament, as, as things collapse, you have almost like a buckling of the ligament, a redundancy. And because of that, it looks thicker because there's now being a redundancy in that, um, in that line. And because of that, it can actually push on um, structures, like maybe even the spinal cord, maybe the nerve roots that are trying to pass and exit. There's also um, a small joints in the back. Um, these are called facet joints. And with the discs, they help you bend and twist. And with time, these discs can also develop arthritis, like how hip joints and knee joints can develop arthritis. And when these facet joints get arthritic, they can get larger. And they can also push on nerves or um, other structures and cause pain as well. So lots of things can cause discomfort. And what's really kind of even more confusing about all this is that we don't have a single diagnostic tool that can tell us this is exactly where the pain is coming from. So what are the imaging modalities we have? So we have x-ray. X-ray is very good for bone. So here we have an x-ray of a person front on. You can see their bones, their vertebrae. You can see empty space where we assume the discs are. And you can even see the facet joints in the back, so the facet joints that I just talked about. Taking the x-ray from a side view, you have what's here on, on the right of the screen. So you have bones again, the vertebrae, the discs that we can't see well. And you can actually kind of get a general idea of a patient's al alignment, just how the discs and the spine is stacking up. Sometimes we actually use x-rays for dynamic um, uh, evaluation. So we actually have the patient bend forward and bend backwards. And we can see on the x-ray how their alignment um, changes. We have more advanced imaging tools. So one thing we do have is an MRI. An MRI is good um, at helping us to really see the soft structures. So again, we have the bones. We can see the discs m much better than we can on the x-ray. So here are the discs. You can actually see the neurological structures. This is the end of the spinal cord. And after the spinal cord end, it actually just has the nerve fibers that are waiting patiently to exit at each level. It's called the cauda equina, so Latin for, um, I guess, horsetail. And it really looks like a horsetail because it's different fibers that are just swimming in the cerebrospinal fluid. So as we age through, we're definitely going to find degenerative changes. So this person's degenerative injuries are pretty bad. Um, you can see the discs have become thinner. They become narrower, they become degenerated, they actually pooch out the back, so bogus. Um, the spinal canal has become really narrow because things have kind of squished down and collapsed and thickened. Um, other people, we take MRIs and we see that their facet joints, those small joints I talked to you about, they can become really inflamed. So this one has a lot of fluid in there. Sometimes they become really gnarly looking because there's bone spurs. But we don't really know if these structures that we see, even though they might be abnormal and degenerative, we don't know if they're the cause of the pain. And that's why diagnosing back pain is really difficult. We're just trying to figure out 
on imaging what's abnormal and trying to correlate and try to make sense, can that be causing the patient's pain symptoms? So you're like, well, there's a lot of things we still need to figure out. So as a physician and as a researcher, you should really get to it. Unfortunately, studying back pain is really difficult um, just because there's, there's a variation in just a natural progression of back pain. So I made this chart myself just trying to illustrate a point, which is here we have the time axis and here we have the severity of pain. So people who develop back pain generally have a sharp increase to their pain. But just over the next days, weeks, months, the pain has a natural fluctuation to it. So sometimes it gets better. Sometimes maybe they lifted or exercised more, it got worse. Then it gets better, then it gets worse. And a lot of people with time, they actually do have a, a, um, a remission in their symptoms. But we don't know how long that would nor normally last before they have another flare. What I'm really trying to show here is that the natural history of back pain is that there's a lot of relapses and remission. And because of that, when we study people with back pain, it's hard to know whether our treatments are really working or we're just catching them now at a good part of their, uh, of their back pain course where we've caught them at a worst part of their back pain course. And so when we do studies with back pain, we have to have a lot of patients to kind of average out that natural fluctuation. The other thing that makes back pain research difficult is that, it's, I mean, I told you, it's hard for us to really narrow down the exact cause of someone's back pain. So they have a little bit of facet arthritis. They have a little bit of a disgeneration. And when we do our studies, we tend to have to lump them all together because we can't just find one thing that's wrong. And because of that, it gets really tricky, right? You, you're not having one single homogeneous population that you can really study accurately. These patients are actually very within the group that you're studying and it makes it makes the study very difficult. So for me, I really push my patients to, um, you know, obviously diagnose things that can be dangerous and that we need to intervene upon. But if we took a good look and we can't single it down to one specific diagnosis, the key is really in trying to manage the pain. So luckily, there's a lot of good non-invasive treatments that we have and most of the time it's enough. The American College of Physicians um, put out a consortium advice. So they, a lot of physicians came together and the, the expert in our field and they came up with some guidelines to what is the best non-invasive treatments. And in the statement, they wrote that given that most patients improve over time regardless of treatment, clinicians and patients should select non-pharmacologic treatment and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Mainly, with enough time, a lot of these patients would get better by themselves. So what we need to do is really to support people through this. And we do have tools, tools that um, you know, individuals can just reach out themselves. So there's things you can get over the counter that would help. So this includes um, over the counter in, um, medications such as ibuprofen and naproxen. Ibuprofen, I like to encourage a good dose, so 600 milligrams three times a day. Naproxen um, is usually more of a two ice a day medication. I always tell my patients to take it with food and enough water because these medications are known to have kidney risks and GI risks. So GI is a gastrointestinal tract, so stomach, esophagus, you know, intestines, whatnot. And it has been shown that anti-inflammatory, so NSAIDs, can increase your risk of GI bleeding. Over a long time, these medications have also been associated with heart risks. So, you know, I do encourage patients to really just try these medications for a short term. And if they're really requiring it over a long term and things are not getting better, then I do want them to see a physician to talk about the risks. There's an over-the-counter uh, Tylenol. Um, Tylenol is actually a very safe medication. The only thing to be careful about is if you have liver failure, then which I really encourage you to stay under 3,000 milligrams a day. Um, a lot of people do find relief from topical agents, so Bengay, Salampong. I really actually like Icy Hot. It has um, menthol, which is a cooling and an anti-inflammatory effect with a methyl salicylate. 
And now they have newer formulations, such as ones with lidocaine in it, which is a numbing agent. So there's a lot of things you can get over the counter. I would try a variety of them. And there's important to pursue complementary care. And um, you know, some of the data on this is still a little bit mixed, but I can find good studies that have shown that chiropractic can be helpful. So chiropractors can do um, a little bit of manipulations. I like it when the chiropractors work um, to also um, help the patient strengthen, as well as doing passive modalities, because I think it's a mixture of the two that's helpful. Acupuncture has been shown to be helpful for chronic pain, so especially pain that's lasted for more than 8 to 12 weeks. And massage therapy is useful because as we have chronic back pain, our muscles are constantly overworking to try to protect and um, to, to stabilize our spine. So massage therapy can work out some of those knots and decrease the amount of symptoms. And when things are not getting better, there is a time when you should see the physician. So what are the things we should work, watch out for? So, one is uncontrolled pain. If the pain is so bad, you can't sleep, you can't function, you can't do what you need to do, then you should probably see a physician because we probably need to think about giving you a stronger medication for pain control. In general, we are taught to look out for pain that's worse at night because at night you generally are not moving. And so if you're not moving and you're still having pain, it gets a little bit more worried. Is there an infection? Is there perhaps even cancer? And if the pain's not improving after three weeks, uh, sorry, uh, 12 weeks, then definitely we want you to see your provider. Um, things that get us a little bit worried and want, uh, make us want to see you sooner is if you're having unintended weight loss, fevers, chills, because this is mean you are having an infection or, or maybe cancer. If you're actually having neurological changes, so actual weakness, that you're having trouble walking, or numbness, even to light touch, or really extreme tingling down the legs, that's something we want to watch out for, and it points us to want to get an imaging sooner. And if you're having any trouble going to the bathroom, so the, the innervation, so the nerves that are supplying your bladder and the very end of your GI tract, those are nerves that are also coming out of your low back. So if something is really majorly going on in the low back, um, they can cause trouble going to the bathroom. So trouble peeing, trouble um, controlling your peeing, trouble with going to the bathroom to poo. These are things we, are, we consider red flags, so things that we really should um, investigate further. And if you're having any issues with that, you should see your physician sooner. But to tell you the truth, a lot of the times, uh, we would not find a cancer, infection, or fracture. They're pretty rare. Fracture is actually the most common thing we will find. And in large studies where they looked at a lot of patients who presented to the doctor and had to have imaging, we only really find them about 4% of the time. Cancer is even more rare. It's less than 1%. And infection, which we're always so concerned about, is extremely rare. It's 0.01%. So besides just for uh, just getting a diagnostic information, you can also see your physician because we can offer you some more intensive treatments. So if the over-the-counter medications are not enough, we can offer you prescription-grade medications. Um, what does this include? It includes stronger anti-inflammatories. My favorite one is meloxicam. It's an anti-inflammatory. You, you can just take one time a day, so it's easy to remember that. And it's, it's because of that, people are more compliant with it. And I think a seven-day course of the meloxicam can really just calm down whatever inflammation there can be and really help with the pain symptoms. When the pain is really bad, we do sometimes have to give people medication to help with the pain control. So if I suspect a muscular component, I like to give people muscle relaxants like Flexero, also known as cyclobenzaprine. You know, if the pain is so severe because you, you, know, you just had an injury about two days ago and now you can't sleep, you can't walk, we do occasionally give people opiates. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that recently because you might have heard there's an opiate epidemic. And so we try to be pretty um, conservative about giving opiates. But if you're not able to function at all, we would consider it. 
And when the pain starts to become a chronic pain, so things that last more than two weeks, three weeks, it's getting on to a couple months, then we really push you to patients to really avoid opiates at that time because there's no study which have shown that opiates can, is helpful for management of chronic pain conditions. And we really encourage patients to consider non-opiate pain medications. These include nerve pain agents such as gabapentin or pregabalin. A variety of antidepressants actually have been shown to be particularly helpful for pain, possibly because they're changing the neurochemicals in the brain, and some of those neurochemicals are also responsible for revving up that pain signal. And certain anticonvulsants, so medications that we give for, uh, to people who have seizure disorders, can also help with managing chronic pain. And I can't emphasize how important therapy is. And by that, I don't even just mean physical therapy, which is a mainstay of our treatment for back pain, but also cognitive behavior therapy and therapy that's just really targeting your lifestyle, so things you're doing around the home. So let's get to physical therapy first. I refer all my patients to physical therapy. Um, physical therapists can work to decrease the pain um, just as it's occurring, so they have modalities that they're exposed to. So they can try heat and cold therapy. They can try myofascial release. When there's a neurological component to this, um, they can try tense unit, which I also um, think is, is worthwhile. And what I tell people is that some of the therapists is doing is not necessarily just trying to, to make the pain better in the short term. I think of therapy as an investment in the future. You're correcting biomechanical abnormalities that is predisposing you to back pain. And you're making an investment to strengthen your core and your hip girdle so that you're less likely to injure yourself in the future. Along with physical therapy, it's really important to just also target how you're processing pain. So, this is kind of more of a developing area of research, but study after study have shown that biopsychosocial uh, factors have a huge impact on pain progression towards chronic pain. So some of this is just how we approach pain. If we think pain is very dangerous and to be avoided, we tend to be too fearful. And so we don't even move like we, we, how we normally move. And that maladaptive behavior can actually really lead you to develop chronic pain. So some of what we do after we're sure there's nothing dangerous is to really encourage patients to, to change their understanding of the pain. And that includes going to someone like a pain psychologist or a behavior specialist and really trying to wrap our mind about how pain is a, a sensation that is produced, but it's not always dangerous. And by changing our understanding of pain, um, that has been proven to actually actually help with chronic pain conditions. And one thing that I think as physicians we probably don't emphasize enough is that I also really encourage my patients to really be their own therapist and think about what they're doing in their daily lives that may be contributing to their symptoms. So I want to give you two examples about this. So I had a patient um, who came to me with actually pretty upper low back pain in almost the, the mid back region. And we were just talking and I encouraged her to continue to pursue physical therapy and to really go home and think about what activities that she's doing at home that may be really contributing to her symptoms. And I saw her back in clinic six months later and she was like, I really figured it out. I haven't come back in a, to you in a long time because my pain is so much better. And so I was like, well, what did you figure out? And it turned out she is an avid cook. So she's spending hours, especially on the weekends, hunched over her chopping board and the stove. And she's a really petite lady. So in order to reach up to the counter and chop, she's almost scrunching her shoulders and bending forward. And when she's you know, at the, at the stove and she's trying to, to uh, stir things, it's, 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 she's really having to really string herself and making herself taller. 
So she and her husband figured this out, and her husband is really nifty around the home and actually built her a, a, a kind of a little platform that she can stand on when she's at the chopping board and when she's at her stove. And by making these lifestyle and posture changes, she was actually able to much better manage her pain, and the pain actually really just resolved. Another thing that um, people need to pay attention to is, you know, a lot of people develop back pain after they've had surgeries or issues with other joints. So we have some patients who come to us after they've had uh, a hip fracture and that needed uh, perhaps even a surgery. And so I had this one patient who came to me and she's having really severe back pain after going through rehab for her hip fracture and then eventually the hip surgery. And she even noticed herself, along with her therapist, that she had a acquired leg de length discrepancy. So one leg was actually now a lot shorter than the other. And she wondered if this could be contributing to her back pain. So I have to tell you, the data on this is kind of varied. Um, some people do believe that if you were born with a slight leg length discrepancy, that you may not that may not be contributing to your back pain. There's actually a really interesting study I read where they looked at um, a company and analyzed um, back pain within uh, its employees. So half of the people were meat cutters, so they were standing for eight hours a day cutting meat. And the other uh, group of employees were just desk workers. So they were the people who were on the phone and talking with customers. And they found that in the meat cutters, the people who were standing more than eight hours a day, having a leg length discrepancy of more than 10 mil millimeters was actually associated with having low back pain. But of the people who were sitting most of the time, the people who were actually answering phone calls, that did not actually make a difference. But in this particular patient, we really thought her like, length discrepancy may be contributing to this, also because it was acquired, so it kind of developed because she's had surgery and that altered her biomechanics. So we eventually got her a shoe lift, and that actually made her symptoms a lot better. So I do think that you know when we're approaching someone with back pain, we can't just um, emphasize medications and therapies. We also have to just look at the patients as a whole and what they're doing on a daily basis. And sometimes by addressing those behaviors, um, we can really actually get to the root cause of their back pain and try to correct that. So a very frequent question that patients come into clinic to ask me is, I had back pain and it actually got better, but I'm really just here because I want to know what can I do to prevent the back pain from coming back? And I don't have a lot of good answers. There's not a lot of studies which really definitely say that doing this would cause you to have back pain and avoiding this would not. There's three things that have been pretty consistent, so I do want to tell you about them. So the first one is very specific, actually. Um, do not operate a jackhammer. So they've done one really good study which shows possibly the vibratory uh, kind of force associated with operating a jackhammer can really lead you to have back pain. It's a huge difference between people who are construction workers who have operated a jackhammer versus people who have not. And perhaps some of that vibratory force just shakes up the annulus a little bit and makes it uh, eventually break down. I don't know. But try not to operate a jackhammer. The second thing is probably a lot more understandable, smoking. Do not smoke. Smoking would make you um, your back pain worse, and it puts you at increased risk of back pain. And we, there have been studies which show that patients who stop smoking tend to make their back pain better. So when I see a patient in clinic and I, I can smell that they have been smoking, this is actually, I spend a lot of time talking about this because I do think that stopping smoking would make a difference. And another thing, a lifestyle choice that's been associated with low back pain is actually um, sedentary activity, so sitting for a very, 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 very long time. And that immobility can lead to deconditioning, that sustained posture in one position can um, kind of lead to biomechanical um, issues such as really tight hamstrings or um, weakened glute meats that they can also really put you at risk for low back pain. 
So after combing the literature, these are the three things I found, and I hope um, you're able to use some of these tips for your future. So now that we're kind of approaching to the end of my portion of the talk, I do want to again conclude for you the things that I've talked about. So one is that back pain is extremely common, but it's, the good news is it's just mostly self-limiting. And so a lot of times I don't need to do anything more invasive like injections or surgeries. A lot, a lot of the time I can support patients through the back pain with um, lifestyle uh, modifications, with medications, with therapies. I do hope you take away from today that sometimes we're not able to find a specific cause of the back pain. Diagnosis is quite difficult. We're all going to have degenerations in our spine. Sometimes we cannot isolate a specific cause. But that's OK, because often self-management is enough, and it is a very good step. And I hope I shared with you some good self-management strategies. And I think you know, all of us in medicine were, were developing a different understanding of back pain. It used to be we were, um, we, we, we thought that our interventions, so injections and surgeries, are, are very curative. But I think with time and as more data come out, we really feel like we need to approach back um, pain in a very, very multidisciplinary fashion. So this includes working as a team, not just as physicians, but also with therapists, with orthotists, with pain psychologists, with pain management specialists. And that's why we created an integrated spine service here at UCSF. And we're really pushing that as an answer rather than just you know sending people to various things and not having a coordinated care plan. So that's uh, most of what I was going to talk about today. Um, you know, we do have another portion, which we're going to talk about uh, some of the back braces that are available. Um, I would take any questions you have right now, but we, you can also hold them toward the end. So the question was about the value of Chinese medicine. Um, for example, Tai Chi uh, seemed to have been good for people with back pain. Um, I do see a lot of value in alternative treatments, including Chinese medicine. So I mentioned acupuncture, and there's I think that's one of the better studied ones. There has actually been studies on Tai Chi and back pain, and it has been shown to be helpful. There is a good component of core strengthening with Tai Chi. And uh, I think it's also just that body awareness that Tai Chi and other forms of these um, exercises really foster that can really help patients in their rehab course. In general, um, what I've seen um, in the evidence for these complementary medicines is that a lot of them are very safe. This includes cupping. This includes some of the um, you know, Eastern kind of myofascial works as well. I do think it's very safe. And because of that, I encourage all patients to try it. I think um, you know even the the NIH, so the the primary government funding source for research, are really recognizing that we do not know enough about complementary medicine. So they're actually funding more research on this line, and I think in the years to come we will know more. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Now that we understand what contributes to your back pain, I'll address the orthotic management that we practice here every day at UCSF at the Orthotic and Prosthetic Center. For this part of the education, I'll go over some of the bracing that you would expect to receive to treat your Pacific back pain. This is not one that you would expect. This is a very old brace called the Milwaukee that was used primarily in the treatment of scoliosis. And as you can expect, the uh, compliance was fairly low. Muscle atrophy, we get at this all the time. If I wear a brace, all my muscles will atrophy. Therefore, my back will be weaker because I've actually used a brace to provide the support that I need. We have not found in any of the studies that this is actually true. A brace can actually help you. As Dr. Zhang said earlier, the worst thing that you can do is to go spend time in bed. And the longer that you're in bed, the worse you'll actually be. So spinal bracing has been shown to produce stability and reduce disc load through hydrostatic compression and splinting of the anatomy. The semi-rigid cylinder produced by the compression brace supports some of the weight of the upper body and reduces stress on the spine. And that's the key factor, that the bracing only supports some of it. You're still using all of your anatomy, all of your muscles to get up, to get out of bed, to walk. 
And that's the primary activity that we normally will state to our patients. It's pretty much the only exercise we state, especially after spine surgery, is to walk. We don't tell people to go to the weight room or to do thousands of crunches. We just want you to physically get out of bed and to walk around. Fracture pain, one of the most common ones that we do see is called a compression fracture. It's one when one of the vertebral body, bodies compresses down on an adjacent vertebral body. Um, you can see this happening quite a bit in osteoporosis, especially if you're a woman over the age of 50 or who has been through menopause. When the bones are brittle or your vertebrae aren't strong enough to support your spine in everyday activities, when you bend to lift an object, miss a step, slip, you can put your spine bodies at the risk of fracture. Even coughing and sneezing could actually cause a compression fracture, but this is extremely rare. Your bones would be very, very brittle if you coughed and actually caused a fracture. Compression fractures happen in the front of the vertebrae. When you get enough of them in the front part of the bone, they can, can collapse. And then one of the things that we show is, you know, why do they use different braces for different fractures? You know, why is one picked over the other one? Bracing should always be chosen by your prescribing physician. I know there's so much on the internet right now. There's infomercials out there. There's sports figures promoting this. You can go online and pretty much buy any one of these things that I'm talking to you here about. But we really highly recommend that you get this prescription through a physician. And then the physician determines the structure. They can look at some of the radiographs. They can look at an MRI to determine which back brace is actually the best for the fracture that you have or the pain that you have in your back. So one of the things that we hear a lot about, and it's still, I believe, on the orthopedic surgery boards, is a thing called the Jewett brace. It was specifically designed for anterior compression fractures. That means when you're actually bending forward and putting more pressure on those vertebral bodies. This particular brace is usually used for one or two of these compression fractures because it doesn't do a whole lot in what's called the transverse plane or the twisting. And it does very, very little is if you extended your back. They call it a hyperextension brace. Technically what it does is it prevents you from bending forward. So the more you bend forward, the more pain that you would have. The less you bend forward, the less pain that you would have. So if we compare that to a TLSO, it's like, well, why do they use this big plastic looking brace? The actual TLSO was pretty much designed about 45 years ago when typically they were putting patients in 35 pound plaster body casts, which was awful. So you couldn't take the cast off at night to go to bed, you couldn't shower with the cast on, they were very heavy, and there was a lot of complications by putting people in body casts. So we got rid of the body casts and started to use these super lightweight thermal plastic jackets, and they, com they allow you to have compression forces. So they push from the front to the back, so they actually provide the squeezing effect which can limit some, again, limit some of the motion in your back. TLSOs are used when you have three or more compression fractures or if you have a compression fracture with another fracture on top of that. So you need a bigger, better structure to support the spine. And then we go into the peri post surgical LSO versus TLSO. The physicians that I've worked with for the past 32 years have almost done it by levels. If you had a level, level four to five fusion, they wouldn't use a thing called a TLSO because a T stands for thoracic, so you're covering much more of the spine. So why do they use an LSO and not a TLSO? From all of my workings with the doctor, they kind of look from L2 to S1, so your lower back, is when they would use a brace called an LSO, a lumbosacral orthosis. When they do a fusion or if you've had a fracture or a burst fracture superior to this L2 vertebrae, then they would use a thing called a TLSO. And what we found by doing this is that we found kind of a glitch. 
that we knew with this plastic TLSO, we started to lose control in the upper thoracic spine. And when we found that, we said, well, how do we control the spine when it goes above T6 or T5 or T4 when we get into the upper portion of the thoracic spine? Then as orthotists, what we basically do is play with levers all day. We said, well, we can make this TLSO brace longer and then we had to put a metal chin piece with a strap on it and a metal occiput piece, and it looked like you were braced from all the way from your neck down. Extremely uncomfortable. It wasn't very nice to wear. They were hard to adjust. When you sit, you have a tendency to compress a little bit. When you stand, the chin piece would be three inches away. So we were trying to figure out what else could we do for this upper portion of the thoracic spine and with this other thing called PJK. And this was a big one here, actually. Uh, Verdot Devrin was very instrumental in this. When we found the glitch in the TLSO, he said, we have to find something different. I don't want to put headpieces on all my patients that have this. Sometimes this happens to a 78, 80-year-old woman, and I don't want her walking around with a metal plastic brace that goes from her chin to her symphysis pubis. And we were looking at things, and the, the funny thing was is that he saw an infomercial. And as he was looking at it as a spine surgeon, he said that doesn't do anything. There's no control from what they're selling on TV. It was a little elastic strap that went around your shoulders and it was supposed to hold you back and keep your posture upright. And he went into all the biomechanics of it and said, um, there's no control. He said the only thing that would help is somebody that didn't have any problems to begin with. So we started to develop this new brace rather than the plastic TLSO they showed you as kind of a static, even though it provides compression. We needed something that pulled your shoulders back. And that's when we started to look at the shoulder harness. And so it was more of a dynamic brace. We ran a structure down the whole entire spine from approximately T2 to S1 and we literally riveted the straps into the brace. So now we have an endpoint structure, a spinal component with a harness onto this to prevent you from bending forward. So we've used this in more than just PJK. So some of the patients came down and said, I need help in my posture, my back's too weak. I've had six surgeries. So we've started to use it in different places and it's actually worked out really well for us. We've been using this particular one now for just over two years. It was first done by orthopedic surgery. Uh, neurosurgery was a little reluctant to kind of jump on. They were so used to using the old style braces, they didn't want to switch. And in the last year, neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery has completely switched to the new style bracing. So it's actually worked out rather well. And here we go again with degenerative disc. I think the biggest thing with a degenerative disc is, yes, you can see it in pictures. Yes, you can look at MRIs or maybe even a little bit onto x-rays. I think the biggest thing with degenerative disc is, is it painful or is it not painful? If we did pictures of everybody in this room, most of us, including myself, over 50, will show some form of degenerative disc. But if you're having zero pain symptoms, I wouldn't recommend any treatment. If it doesn't hurt, therefore, don't go to the doctor. There's been a lot done with degenerative discs. There can be a multitude of factors that goes into this. If you're in the acute phase and it is very, very painful, it's hard to even get up from sitting in a chair to actually stand. It was hard to get into the car to go to the doctor's office then we can try to use a brace for you for support for a short period of time along with the, all the other treatments. If you're in acute pain, it's hard to go to the physical therapist because the only thing you can think about is just the pain that you're having in your back. What we want to do is to provide a little bit of support so that you can get up out of bed that we talked about earlier and start to move again. And we've showed time and time again that this is much better for back pain, much better for generative discs than just staying in your bed 24 hours a day. There are so many that were out there and the one thing that I wanted to note here at the end of this is that even the government has looked into these and what they found was if a brace does not have 
a structural component to it. Plastic, metal, they used to use some of the metal stays that were in it. They would no longer pay for these braces. So some of the ones that you see out there that are just neoprene, they do provide a little bit of compression. Yes, you can run around in it, it feels pretty good, but we found that there's no structural component to it. It really doesn't stop any motion. The other thing about some of these braces that we like to kid around with as orthotists is this thing called kid aesthetic reminder. What I kind of look at that is, is when you bend improperly, you drop the spoon on the floor, you know you're not supposed to just bend over and pick it up, it pokes you in the ribs or it gently reminds you, use your knees to bend down. Don't keep using your back in these ways that it could, could cause further injury or to make your pain flare up again. So that was a little on our kinesthetic reminder. That's the thing about pain, it all demands to be felt. Any questions? In today's medicine right now, if you go to your prescribing physician or to your general practitioner, what I do, and this is even personally, my uh, primary care doctor knows where to refer me to. So if I went for him for back pain and he said, well, we think there's a little bit more than, you know, just a minor ache, then he either could refer me to the orthopedic surgeon or the neurosurgeon. So I use the primary to get to the referral sources. Actually, so Kaiser does have some plans. They do kind of subcontract out to some different places. And I don't believe UCSF is one of those, but if you did kind of kind of push the issue a little bit, I know at Kaiser you have to ask a few times to get an MRI, that at that point they will do certain things. There's been, there's a lot of splints and um, not so we call over the counter that Kaiser has at their disposals where you know UCSF is one of five hospitals that actually has an orthotic and prosthetic program in it. We see that that to be growing, but a lot of the primary care doctors do know about bracing. There's still tests on boards about some of this because it involves a lot of biomechanics and how you would treat A, B, or C. Basically what your insurance company is looking for, is it medically necessary? You know, is it just another thing that they're putting out there or is there like a biomechanical reason behind it? We were just kind of discussing this earlier. In the last couple of years, there's been huge changes. Everybody kind of follows Medicare. If Medicare, you know, if there is the golden rule, every insurance company will follow. They're looking for documentation. Why do you need it? When are you going to use it? How long do you need to use that for? And that was my other point, that it's really, really important for the patients to ask the prescribing physician how long to wear it. I've worked in numerous orthopedic clinics and they walk out, they turn around, we're all in the room together, they walk out and they forget to say, oh, you're only supposed to wear this for three weeks or you're supposed to wear this for six months or I only want you to wear this when you're active because by the time they get to the therapist or to me, we don't know exactly what the doctor was thinking at the time. So I really want that. And another one that our spine team has just done right now too with that, going back to that point, they want to be in control to tell their patients how long, especially after spinal surgery, they don't want anybody else to tell their patients how long they need to wear the brace. They want to be in control of it. For the most part, I would say majority of insurance companies, 95% of the time will cover one of these things as long as we have the documentation that goes along with it and then we can get it put through. Thank you.